just trying to get the mic without toppling everything over. That would be a great start. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Rama. That's very kind. Um, very excited to be on this panel. Um, I don't know if you have either read or seen any of the films um, written and directed by my two co-panelists, um, but they are very impressive and well worth checking out. Um, because we don't have much time, there's actually a lot to discuss, I'm going to launch into it straight away. I'm going to ask you, Dr. Viola, um, about the difference in the, the, the panel's headline is Revolutionary Cinema, Revolution and Cinema. And just to give us a brief potted history of the difference between the two. So A, define you know, what you think is the difference between the two and what is the history of the two genres. Um, okay, good evening. Uh, first of all, um, uh, thank you for chairing this. And thank you for the invitation, Alma. I'm really very glad to be back here. Uh, I think two years ago I was already here, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be back. Um, yeah, a lot uh, has happened in between, actually, these two years. And exactly uh, one of the things that happened is that uh, these kind of questions came up because of uh, uh, the Arab rebellion. Um, uh, this is one of actually my, my personal concerns. Um, not only because I, I, uh, I'm also a, a filmmaker, so in a way I always try to bridge between theory and practice. Not very successfully very often, but you know, life is about searching and learning. It's not uh, actually about accomplishment. So that's my, uh, hope, hopefully I'll try to make that from, to my, uh, make that to, um, to become my philosophy. Um, yeah. Um, in the beginning, uh, in 2011, I'm, who, who maybe you know was following the events, uh, particularly on the, in the field of cinema, must have seen that uh, in uh, Cannes, that was May 2000, Festival of Cannes, May 2011, the first film came out. Uh, about uh, about the Egyptian Revolution, and it was um, an episode film with different episodes made or directed by different Egyptian directors, and the film came out, you know, um, as one of the first films. At the same time, there was also it. It was called. Um, oh my goodness! Can you help me? Uh, Revolution. Eighteen days. Eighteen days, exactly. Thank you. My, my, um, you know, I didn't sleep that night very well. So my, my, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, at the same time, there was also a documentary that was created. It was the bad, the beautiful, and the politician. Uh, so also by three directors. So these were the first films that came out. Um, and in, in Tunisia, we have the same uh, picture. Uh, immediately, uh, two, uh, uh, at least two, f uh, two documentary films came out, but all of them were actually more or less very descriptive, in the sense that they were uh, picturing uh, the events that just had took place. Um, and some of them, of course, I mean, in the middle of, of, of what the ongoing events, it was very difficult actually to, to do more, uh, anything more than just observe and, and uh, you know, maybe give a chronological description of what's going on. Um, so at that time, uh, we had a lot of discussions about this. And, and Daoud Abd Said, who is one of the known Egyptian directors, he told me quite, he's uh, really the master of irony. So he said, you know what? There is really a big difference between films on revolution and revolutionary films. And this was actually the initial question, and he's right. Um, I then at that time I started then uh, looking a bit or going back to film history, and if we go to uh, look uh, into you know film books, we will find that revolutionary cinema, the term is actually um, much more linked to um, uh, the very first um, uh, revolutions of the ninth, of the eighteenth uh, of the twentieth century, excuse me, the twentieth century, uh, namely the October Revolution or the revolution in in. Russia, and uh, the first wave of so-called revolutionary cinema were actually the films by Tika Bertov and uh, Eisenstein. And what was so revolutionary about them? First of all, we have to see that they didn't 
they weren't made in 1918, but they were made, you know, like 10 years later. Uh, or uh, Eisenstein, even at the height of his work, was you know he he worked uh, really towards the end of the of the twenties. And Giga, his master Giga Berthoff's masterpiece, uh, the man with the mo movie camera, was made in in in, uh, in 2000, um, uh, 2019, uh, 27. You will see. I have a real problem with names and dates. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if any one of you saw this this film. Did, did any one of you saw Man with the Movie Camera? It's a fantastic film. Watch any video clip, clip or musical clip today and go back to the Man with the Movie Camera and please compare and you will find everything was there and what these guys are doing this day is most, mostly and largely much more boring than what, he, what this guy did in, 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 in the 20s. Uh, and this is what this is because actually he had a vision. Eisenstein and Giga they had a vision about cinema uh, that is translate revolution into form and not just into a story or into a descriptive in, into you know uh, like um, observing and 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 uh, telling in a descriptive way the story. Actually, they were very much against the uh, Hollywood uh, style of cinema, against the narrative film in the classical sense. They didn't want to have a plot in that sense. They were trying really to picture uh, the, you know, the, the class conflict on the very, base, on the very basic um, uh, level of the film language. And this is how we have to understand films by, uh, that were made by Eisenstein and by, uh, by Giga Berthoff. OK, so now this is the. I, I don't want, of course, then to go into the history of Latin American cinema. There are several, actually, uh, in, in, if you go um, uh, back to film history, there are several periods where, uh, you know, um, uh, social and political upheavals have brought about also a real change in, uh, or at least attempts, you know, to create a different kind of cinema that is different than the narrative uh, cinema, to create uh, a cinema that is close to the people, that expresses, you know, uh, uh, the underprivileged, um, but also on the level of form, not just on the level of content, uh, on, uh, you know, on the level of, on the narrative level. So you're saying that there's a form of cinema that actually is both revolutionary and about revolution. So to reflect the revolutionary content in a revolutionary type, type or form. Oh, well, that's the goal, but it has not necessarily to be about, you know, revolution as such. But right. uh, there is a sort of attitude behind it, artistically. Right. Of course, there is another problem here, that not all these kinds of films uh, appeal really to. I mean, some of these films, particularly in Latin America, there were a lot of, of attempts in the 60s and so to do really films for the people. Mm -hmm. and. These, but very often these were intellectuals, and they were trying to work on the form, but not not very often this appealed to uh, you know to the people. Interesting. This would be a good point to bring in Sarah because you've made two films, um, and both quite different in nature. And I think that would be a good segue to talk about a the difference in the how both films were made, as far as you're concerned, and how they were received. Did you think perhaps one was a bit too esoteric, and the other kind of more visceral, and people could connect to it? Or did you feel that they were both received quite well um, and were both accessible because of the conditions of the time people were interested? Um, yeah, thank you um, for having me as well. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, with, with the two films, it was interesting because at the time it really didn't cross my mind um, that you know, they would be representing so much or that they, you know, that they were necessarily different. Um, in, in terms of the message that they were carrying or in terms of the, you know, the way they represented revolution. Um, but retrospectively and, and, and in seeing the way the film has been perceived and the way the film has been critiqued perhaps um, and dissected by audiences, um, this became a lot more evident. Um, with the first film, Karama Has No Walls, it was a very uh, knee-jerk reaction to, to, to make the film because um, it was at a point where, where journalists and um, uh, just media personnel in general being, were being uh, kicked out of Yemen and, there, and anyone you know, with, with, with any sort of journalist badge wasn't allowed to, to, to conduct their work in a normal fashion. So this encouraged, obviously, the youth 
um, and anyone who had uh, had possession of a camera to go out and start documenting and um, and uh, disseminating what they had through the internet, which you know in itself is an extremely revolutionary way of, of spreading information. Um, since the invent, you know the invention of, of printed press, basically, and people were receiving these images and um, not necessarily cohesive films, but still images that, that then became the basis for these films. Um, as and when they were happening, before, before mainstream media was even able to, to, to find this, to, to get access to this news. So in the making of, of Karama Has No Walls, it was, it, was a, it was like, as I said, it was very natural. It was a very sort of um, knee-jerk reaction to sort of film testimonies, um, film documents, what was going on, um, the, the, the revolution itself, the protests, the, the general feeling at the time, what was going, what was going on. And to piece these things together over the course of the months, you know, sort of in, in 2011, just before um, the sort of just before the end of 2011, when Maria um, Abdullah Saleh in Yemen was sort of, uh, tra the, there's a transfer of power. Um, what was revolutionary about, well, what, it was definitely the content, obviously. People were then able to see what was happening on the ground. They were able to see how the youth really took matters into their own hands, how they were able to transmit information without, without having permission necessarily of mainstream media or you know, commissioning editors or, or producers who would, give, you know, who would then give them the space um, on the air. Um, they, just, they were able to upload stuff and get it out there. With the Mulberry House, the difference between the two that I found was that it's, um, it was more the film itself, the way it came about, that was that was more for me the way I saw it was more groundbreaking than the actual content. The content is very simple. It's very basic. It's been done before. It's about a family. It's about um, it's a very personal story about my relationship to my father and my grandfather. And then the revolution happens. So it kind of then is brought into the story, but is very much in the background. So a lot of what is being discussed, a lot of, of what is focused on really is that transformation within the family unit and their relationship with the presence of a camera inside the house. In a very conservative country where women, you know, are, are covered up most of the time, and it's, you know, se separate, and it's segregation, so men and women don't really mix anyway, so to have a camera there, which is basically the outside world coming into the house, um, into this sort of very private, um, space, um, the, the, basically the acceptance of the family of this and the gradual opening up of the family and acceptance in terms of the camera just being there as a physical thing and also them then opening up to this and, and communicating and connecting with it on a very direct level over the course of a year and a half of, through the making of the film, that to me represented a lot of the shifts that, you know, and the way people perceived cinema and what it could do for them. Coming from, you know, initially from a position where people were very, very skeptical as to what, you know, cameras did, to then being in a position where they would encourage the use of the camera because they knew that it was a means to an end and it was really something that would benefit them in the end. No, I, I agree. Having seen both films, the um, Karama Has No Walls is very much uh, sort of an Arab Spring product, which is duck and dive, you know, um, uh, lots of shooting and blood and kind of images that we become accustomed to vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the Arab Spring. And so even though it's very visceral, it's kind of nothing that nobody had, people hadn't, you know, not seen that kind of stuff before. So it seemed familiar, but very graphic. But actually, you're completely correct about the Marlborough House and that I'd never seen anything like that before. And it was, it was gentle, but very arresting, because it just was somebody's house, and it reminded me of my parents, and, and they forgot the camera was there, and there are moments when your dad just asked, kind of asked you to stop and moved away and giggled. But there was a moment from the film, which was very touching, right at the beginning, actually, which I'm assuming is kind of when everybody had got comfortable, um, where they're talking about relationships and whether men and women should have relationships before they get married or just have an arranged marriage. And one of the men began talking about um, the sexual hormones that a woman has when she's in love. And he launched into this diatribe, and then all the men 
kind of gathered and realized that then he stopped because he realized that there was an audience and there was a camera and I thought that was really powerful um, but this was a kind of an average you know conservative family in this moment was captured so I in that sense I completely agree with you that it is more revolutionary in its in its content rather than its um, in its plot now so I have a question for both of you from that point so did you feel in the reception to the Mulberry House that there was a sense of Western incursion or the fact that they were being subjected to a Western documentary process and in one of your books you talk about acculturation and how people viewed in the Arab world people move, viewed movies, movies as very much a Western art form um, that demanded people to adapt and to westernize rather than something that people felt was indigenous and could become indigenous to the Arab world. So I'll take your answer first. As how do you th was, there, was there that knee-jerk reaction to seeing as a foreign interference um, or was the ownership of it better received? Um, I think it, it happened, you know, it's, uh, with reference to Karama Hazan Walls, the the participation of the people in the film um, was really as, was basically to counter that, you know, instead of them, the West, coming in and making a film about them, the youth were prepared to do something about themselves to, to basically, you know, to basically get in there first and to make sure that they were telling their own stories from their own perspectives and their experience using their own footage, their voice. Um, and um, in terms of, the, in terms of the Mulberry House, I think it was, um, I think it was very, it was very similar. The way I, I saw the family respond to it, in discussions that we had off camera as well, when whenever they felt quite anxious about the camera being around, um, you know, and, and there were, you know, there were conversations about how they might be perceived by the outside world, and they were nervous about it. Of course, you know, they said, well, if we have this discussion, you know, about marriage or what if we're perceived as backward, right? Because you know, this this doesn't adhere to sort of concept, Western concepts of, you know, mm. um, gender relationships and, you know, seg you know, segregation and, you know, it might just, we, we don't want to portray ourselves in the way that they might want to, to see us, basically. So that d debate always was, was, was there and that worry was always there, but, you know, what we came, you know, the conclusion we came to obviously was just to be as natural as possible. And even if those things did come through, and that it is your nature and it is the reality, um, it's a very raw and real situation, and you you can't help but then see those views and those standpoints from a very kind of a very authentic perspective, and that they don't necessarily have to be fundamentalist extremists or you know have, or be backward or yeah, um, but also without being sort of painting them with an orientalist sort of brush, which is tricky. Yeah, which can be very tricky. And, and, what, and so what, what do you, how do you perceive the work that has, has started to come out since the Arab Spring, um, which is a term I hate, but for want of a better term. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think I, Brian went ahead in the audience rebellion. calls it the Arab, Arab Awakening, so maybe we'll go with that. Um, Arab, Arab Purgatory. Arab Purgatory, that's a new one. <laughs> Arab, we'll wait and see, it's too early, but that doesn't roll off the tongue as well. Not the nice <laughs> it's not like a paradise in hell or a bit of it. No. <laughs> it would not, we don't know how it will end. So since it, the event, started, um, and the work that has happened, as, a, as somebody who can see this from a historical point of view, how much do you think that the work that has come out has been for a Western audience, or with an eye to a Western audience to try and be zeitgeisty and take advantage of the interest that is that has come to bear on the Arab world at the moment, and how much was indigenous for local audiences, um, and how much does that reflect the tension in general historically between cinema as a Western art form and as a Arab art form? I, I love the term indigenous. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> I actually, in, in, in research, uh, I mean, I know uh, some studies, they actually use it rather for the Australians and so on. Yeah, you know, the native indigenous is, uh, <laughs> is a very specific term. Um, Can you hear Dr. Vila? Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
Now, indigenous, uh, you know, I think we have surpassed that uh, yeah. quite a while ago, you know. Uh, um, uh, if we speak about acculturation and uh, uh, what uh, the, 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 what you were talking about about acculturation that was maybe a problem that was uh, in the beginning of you know uh, in when the media uh, was invented and started to spread but we know you know that films were shown already I mean the Lumiere brothers uh, invented uh, uh, the the filmmaking and I, I mean the the gadget and so on and and it was like three week, uh, three months later it, the films were already shown and shot in, in North Africa. Uh, so, um, but still, there was a cultural appropriation in the sense that uh, the medium was appropriated, but at the same time, also local, uh, local uh, practices practices were also integrated and and um, and merged with uh, you know that that modern medium. Okay, so in that sense. It is not always useful to speak about the East-West divide, particularly not these days, uh, because um, um, at least since the 30s and since the advent of the, of uh, you know the uh, uh, first of all of of uh, film, uh, the, the sound uh, film, and later on with the with. Uh, uh, um, uh, with the appearance of television in the region, we we are dealing with a mass media culture also in in the Middle East, uh, and if, and today and particularly during uh, now, if we move very quickly to the to the uh, part of the revolution, we all know uh, to which extent new media played a, a role uh, in triggering the the events and as a catalyst and really as a factor, a, a very active factor. Uh, I mean, we were uh, just yesterday, uh, um, uh, the day before yesterday, I, I was running a workshop with young Arab filmmakers, and one of them has a project about, uh, you know, the revolution not as the product of virtual reality, but actually, uh, 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 no, not not the the revolution not be, having been triggered by virtual reality, but actually virtual reality as the more real thing. Then, yeah, uh, and he's right actually, because a lot, a lot, a lot happened all the time on the virtual level, and I think the West could not have dreamt of having all these, you know, uh, these uh, uh, these dynamics going on. Um, so. In that respect, the films that were made, I mean, these were people, these are people who are in the sense of media lit literate people. They are not illiterate. We're not dealing with <coughs> illiterate or indigenous culture, I'm sorry. I mean, these are literate people who have, you know, the everyone has, and, and you remember all the images from the square, from the different squares. Every second person has a has a has a, a phone and is filming, and this was exactly uh, the uh, the reason why some of the of the um, uh, cooperatives like Mussolini, for example, and Sarah can later on speak about it, um, were actually trying to collect all this material and uh, archive it and start to um, uh, uh, to digest it later, because. What I was speaking about, I mean, revolutionary cin cinema is actually the process of digestion, and uh, it, it's not like. And the problem with re with media and revolution in the beginning was that you know, I mean, the, the square. I don't think that we ever had a place in this world that was filmed as excessively as the Tahrir Square do during the 18 days. I don't think we have as much material. Of any you know event in the recent history, so okay for the filmmakers now, Egyptian or Tunisian or whatever, I mean for them it was the issue. How do you deal with these images? I mean the t television and and the ca the small cameras and the mobile phones are everywhere. So where does the film? Where actually then does filmmaking start? So, so can you talk, talk a little bit about the collectives that you work with that, that the, the doctor referred to there and how these images are then curated um, and, and uh, sort of threaded into a narrative? What happens to them and how are they, how are they curated and, and gathered by people? 
Um, well, the two, the two collectives that I have experience with are the Muslim Collective uh, in Cairo, where I live currently, and, um, and the Support Yemen Collective in Yemen, um, which I was a co-founder of. And the way they, they're both run is very similar. So it's, it's, it's run by a group of activists um, who, who have cameras, so they go, you know, they go out and they document events that are happening. Um, and, and they, they save them in their archives and for future reference and for more pressing issues they, they each have YouTube pages where they then upload, they, they edit uh, short sort of, uh, summaries of an event that's happened using that footage just for the purpose of immediacy and to get news out um, and they collect testimonies um, from victims and victims' families um, of the various different issues and violations of human, human rights that, that, that um, are taking place in, the, in both countries. Um, also keep you know, storing them in, in archives but and using um, the necessary material to get, get information out. Um, so a lot of the material, I mean, you've, you've probably had experience seeing some of the material in the Soviet archive. Um, there's a huge, huge collection of stuff that, um, you know, is, is then digested over a period of time and then there's a couple of people who are then responsible for maybe taking a look at the material at various different periods, obviously with a very different pers you know, perspective. On what I think it's, it's very interesting to see how, how different your perspective can change on the same piece of, of uh, the same image um, from when it was first taken to then a year later or two years later and you know, the, the sort of the irony sometimes that you can pick out from some of the, some of the stuff, and it's the, especially in Egypt where you're going from sort of the Sinubonic period uh, to then the, the uh, Mursi period, the military, and then the coup, and then sort of and, and, and the, the similarities that you can pick up throughout as well between all of these different periods. Right? So it's, it's, it's interesting that way to sort of get a, a broader um, perspective on everything that happened from, from then until now. Um, and then sort of, and obviously the, the, the film or the, the, the video that would come out of this would, be, would have a very different tone. So it's important, um, my experience for, for, for Support Yemen is very similar, where we had, there were things that we, we now look at and find are quite naive as well. So some of the things that we posted or we, we, we edited and made um, as and when they were happening. Um, the tone changed as well throughout, you know, the very beginning it was very hopeful, it was very idealistic, it was very young and naive and um, and then as time went on you can actually see how our state of mind, the state of mind of the people also changed um, to a more sort of depressed and, and negative and um, hopeless, you know, sort of as time went on. Um, but all of this material, yes, is, is stored for future reference as well, so they can then go, go back and, and, I guess, um, make something a little more, uh, you know, reflective. More reflective. Um, I think, and this is bears out across the board, or in all of media, is that everybody over the past two, three years became an Arab expert. Um, everybody's an ISIS <laughs> expert these days. Everybody, you know, spent three months in Mosul when they were 12 and knows why ISIS exists. Um, and there was a glut of Arab experts um, and uh, writers and filmmakers because there was this um, great focus. So how, how much of a risk do you think there is and how much do you think um, there has been work that has been produced over the past four or five years which has been rushed or poor quality or had, um, had already a preconceived narrative that they wanted the images to fit? Because I'm sure, I mean, I've seen it just in, in you know, journalism and writing. So how much has that happened for, as far as you can see in, in um, film? If you allow me, uh, very quickly. I think that happened a lot actually in Western films. Yeah. Not so much in Arab films. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there was a need, you know, like to report and to tack on and da 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 da. I mean, there are different, in, some of them are actually quite valuable as documents. For example, like Art Wars by, uh, that's a German film. And uh, there was, I think, also an Irish. Uh, who uh, went to, uh, to, to, to Yemen, I, I for, forgot the, the title again, again, again. It was two years ago in Sheffield. Uh, it was about a tourist guide and, uh, you know, 
uh, and uh, and then and exactly. Uh, I mean, you know, and you sense immediately it's the urge. You know, you want to be topical and you want to throw something out, but you don't understand nothing actually about the place where you are in, and you are not even willing to, uh, you know, expose yourself. Um, so that happened a lot. On the other hand, on the Arab side, I think what happened, I mean, okay, there are always opportunists as well, you know, people who try to sell, uh, for sure. But there was an urge and a need, you know, because in that, in that situation, people were very much hurt and vulnerable. And it was a very strong emotional uh, experience. And I mean, Sarah can certainly talk about that more. Uh, people were really, really, really in a completely, suddenly in a completely different reality, actually. A different rhythm, a different emotion, and a different also interaction. So, and this made some people, you know, I, I know two reactions. I know, I know several colleagues like me also, we stood there and said, you know, we were, I was not able to touch a camera mm -hmm. for months. And I know at least two colleagues, who, a, a, a filmmaker and a, and, a, and a camera woman, who said exactly the same thing. She could not touch a camera. And the other reaction was, shoot, 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 shoot as much as you can and put together because you wanted to, to you know, like to have a, sa a safety valve and get that out, that, that tension. So everyone has his different, has his or her reaction to what happened because it was a very strong, strong emotional experience. Okay, and then after that first period, then came the depression, and people started, and some of them started now trying to digest. Mm -hmm. And one of them is, for example, Ahmed Noor mm -hmm. with his film uh, Waves, and or on the Tunisian side, I would say Babylon, which is a, an extremely strange film. Mm -hmm. I, did anyone of you see that or hear about it? It's a, a collective exit. They went to the borders, Libyan borders, Libyan-Tunisian border, and they stayed there for several months and shot the, the building and the destruction of a, a, a refugee camp. And it was amazing because the film was not subtitled <laughs> intentionally. And what you see there is a real Babylon. People f f coming in from 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 uh, from Libya, being stuck there. You know, Africans, Pakistanis, uh, a lot of Bengalis people, all kinds of nations. And these people were stuck there in the middle of the desert without any means, and sometimes lacking even doctors, killing themselves. It was really, you know, like the whole film, <coughs> just a silent observation without any subtitles about this camp. And if you look at, I mean, I'm sorry, I do not want to extend, but yeah. if you look at that, it's actually an extension of what was already done under Ben Ali. The issue of silence is, has a very strong, uh, uh, um, is a, is a very strong factor in 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 some of the films uh, like Rita Cleary's films or uh, or one of the um, uh, of the exit me members who made also a be very beautiful film The Stadium under the dictatorship and the issue of silence that people are silenced they do not speak and it's all about place and space and so on so in a in a sense this is revolutionary but it's also a continuation you know like of of the dictatorship mood yeah. So uh, this is what I'm talking about. It's film language. It's something different than you know, just throwing out the chronology of yeah. of the events, like uh, for example, brought, born on the 25th of July by Ahmad Rashwan, for example. Yeah, got it. So there was um, just before I um, I move on to you about these films that have been reflective films. Has anybody seen a documentary by a Saudi woman called Safa Al Ahmed about the Shia uprising in eastern Saudi Arabia? This is an absolutely remarkable film. It came out about six weeks ago on a BBC documentary, and it was footage over the past two, three years. Um, a small town in the eastern province, which was Shia, and uh, she went and, as you did, collected and curated a lot of the footage, shot some of it on her mobile phone, and then two, three years later put it all together. And there wasn't even necessarily a narrative, it was just because Saudi is so dark to anybody outside it, you can't see these images. Um, and I, I spoke to her about it and she said that she was pleased that it took her so long 
to get the images out and to put them into um, a form because at the time when the Shia uprisings began, she thought this was it and it was going to happen and the Saudi regime was going to be toppled and that the, that was going to infuse her material. But as it happened, it was crushed and people died and people, protagonists in the documentary died. And so it, it was kind of, it was sort of a very mournful, matter of fact, very realistic documentary at the end of the day. So how much pressure did you feel on a personal level? Because if you feel very strongly about these things, as you, as you said, as a, as a, as a filmmaker, um, and how hard did you have to fight to kind of remove yourself from the material, especially with Mulberry House, which is quite personal? Mm -hmm. um, and how much pressure do you think people like Serene and the other collectives face themselves and from outside forces to kind of not necessarily produce work that is uh, just bare and true, as opposed to slightly embellished, if you know if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Um, I think they're, they're slightly different because the audiences are, are, are different as well and, um, and the form is different too. I mean, in terms of, in terms of the, the approach to Karama, Has No Walls and the Mulberry House, um, in, you know, looking back in retrospect, I think that um, I can understand that reaction where there was the temptation to, to just not touch a camera and just watch and see what happened. And, and then sort of reflect on it and then make a film that is sound and, and true to the reality of the situation. But then the danger of that would be that it just continues to, to roll on and on and on until you become completely um, paralyzed <laughs> because you just can't encompass it in a film. And I think what I, what I, I ended up doing, and, or the choice that I made was that, and I'm glad that I did to make that choice, was that I just did it mm. at the time be, and used and my, my team and I used the sort of the fuel of the anger that we felt and the I guess the desperation to try and get information out because it was such a media blackout um, that forced us to just act and think later and actually when I think about it now if I hadn't if we hadn't done that at the time at the time neither film would have actually come come to light. Um, because events were, were very, very, you know, you know, changing very quickly. And also with the Mulberry House, I mean, luckily with Karama Hazan Walls, it just encapsulates the events of one day. So I was able to, over the course of a year, add captions and commentary to sort of elucidate what happened after, afterwards and to put the film into a little bit more context, um, especially after Saleh stepped down and then was given the silent and uh, you know, and, and given uh, immunity from pros prosecution. Whereas with the Mulberry House, the difficulty with it was that the film was, I had to keep going back to film. Mm. Even when I thought, you know, I, f I thought I'd finished filming after six months and then realized that that wasn't enough. I had to then go back and film some more. And the mood was ever changing and the attitudes were ever changing and the, the characters were, you know, shifting and dynamics in the household were shifting. Um, so it was a very difficult film to, to actually finish because it, everything was just constantly moving. Um, in terms of the in terms of the collectives, you know, there's more of a sort of people were waiting. People would actually go onto these websites or they would wait for the Sudanian Facebook page and the Support Yemen Facebook page to just to, to update with something, you know, whenever whenever there was an, an event going on. And if it wasn't, there'd be a sort of disappointment. So people weren't actually waiting on a very succinct, well edited film that that shows everything that was going on. They just wanted news and they wanted testimonies and they wanted to see it from you know, as and when it was happening. Um, so there was less pressure actually working on those on those things. Of course, there's more pressure that you know they feel that they need to get stories out. So there's always a time pressure. Obviously, you know you have to do it as and when it happens. You know sometimes it'd be a 24-hour deadline, sometimes a 12-hour deadline, sometimes. Um, and and I guess there are those there are those pressures as well with the longer blue form films, um, but. You know, you can always kind of edit it in a way that it's and, and contextualize it, and the audiences are then a little bit more um, accept, a little bit more open, I guess, to sort of understanding. Especially if you go then and you have a Q and A session, you can maybe elaborate. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, I think there's they're two quite different sort of approaches. Yeah. Um, 
which is interesting and since we mentioned Q&A sessions, aren't we smooth? Mm -hmm. Like it just looks like it's all very well scripted, but it's not. Um, we could talk forever, but I think we've got about 15 minutes. Is that enough time? Yeah, 10, 15 minutes. Um, but if we have two panelists, I think I'll give you 15 rather than 10. So are there any questions for the panelists at all? Um, I'm very interested in a few things. One is that you mentioned, uh, you mentioned about poor quality. And I've been doing a lot of work. I, I just did a book called Serious Speaks Art and Culture from the Frontline. So we're also looking at uh, documentary film, feature films, as, as part of this sort of explosion of creative expression that's come out of the Syrian uprising. Um, there was a mention of poor quality footage. I mean, if you talk to the Syrian activists, they're talking about the new aesthetic of low resolution. So that's something that is uh, very applicable to the mobile phone footage and just some of the cheaper camera footage that's available. Another thing that people have been talking about and wondering about is that when YouTube starts charging to view this material, there will not be an archive where, whatever you want to call it, Arab purgatory, Arab awakening, whatever, that this sort of material is going to be available from. So I'm wondering if anybody knows if there is like a greater archive project where people can upload or collect, um, or, or as, a film, as filmmakers, are you thinking about this now? Um, yeah, there is. I, I do remember back in 2011 being approached by, um, by the likes of Mussolini at that point when I was still in Yemen and uh, by other activists in Libya and, uh, and Tunisia and, and the, the idea was to, was to form uh, a site where we could all upload our, our images um, and have an archive that was open basically and, and accessible to everybody. Um, I think that has you know, that, that's kind of lost momentum a little bit, but the idea is still there, and, and speaking with other activists, that that is something that is still, the, the problem is, 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 as I mentioned before, is the speed of events and the, and, and the way in which they change very quickly, and there's so much, so much out there, as you mentioned, you know, so much from Tahrir Square, so much from Change Square, so much stuff that, that still needs to be filtered through, and the quantity is just, I think, it's, too much to manage at the moment. Um, so what we are finding is that you know uh, sites like YouTube and 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 Vimeo and you know aren't aren't capitalizing on a lot of this. So it's not exactly open you know to to everybody. It's not you know so it is being. Um, yeah, I, um, the issue of archive. I mean, there are several. Um, um, in, uh, initiatives, and I'm not really um, on top of the of 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 you know uh, knowing all about it. Uh, I know that one year ago or two years ago at the Berlinale, for example, there was one project that was presented. It was something I think AUC was involved, and they had you know it was a project trying to upload uh, um, uh, different issues. And I'm sure this is you know there is a lot more out there. Uh, I personally, I'm not familiar with it, you know, I, I did not follow up with it, uh, but if you if you search you will find a lot um, and so I don't think everybody is only, uh, you know, dependent on, on, on uh, YouTube in that, in that sense. Uh, and then if you go back to the idea of quality, I would say, you know, quality, uh, even, you know, I mean, two years ago there were, or three years ago there was a film in Leipzig uh, by, made by an Iranian uh, who, young woman who visited I uh, Iran and she made the first cell phone documentary. Well, that's, you know, it's not about low quality. I mean, low quality seems, you know, like, uh, uh, it's from the from the point of view of the technicians who work for television. But the idea is we can, of course, create uh, out of that a, a different aesthetic. And, and I mean, in Brazil, they were speaking about, you know, uh, the dirty cinema. And it was about actually, you know, uh, kind of not, not aestheticizing, aesthet but about creating a real appropriate, uh, um, a pro yeah, a, a real uh, um, proper and adequate, adequate film, film aesthetic and language that, that uh, is is more suitable than, for example, the images of you know the the um, advertisement images and so on. 
Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask the two of you what you could say had changed when it came to practices of archiving since the beginning of the uprising until today. Um, I'm just thinking, for example, with Egypt, um, and maybe at the beginning of the uprising there was a sense of political solidarity. But as, um, as the past years have kind of unfolded, there's been more of a fragmentation. And I sense that, like for example with Museveen, there was less of a focus on documenting protests of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, maybe because their political goals were seen as being antagonistic to that group. So as an activist and as a filmmaker, how do your goals sort of shift as, as things are unfolding? I'll leave that to Sarah. I just wanted to say there is also the Sematic project, and they are dealing actually with archiving, but they archive also, you know, like old uh, 19 millimeter films and so on. So the issue of memory has become very important and crucial after the revolution in all Arab countries. Because, you know, it seems when, the, when things change, you know, when there is a sort of uh, um, uh, sh shake, shaking up of, of, of uh, society and, po and, and political life, all of a sudden there is also an identity problem and memory is very much linked to it and archiving as well. So uh, the archive that's very much in the focus and there is also a common project uh, between the Arsenal in, in Berlin and the Cimatek for example. So there is a lot of, of stuff going on in that respect, but now Okay, you, you may respond to the political issue, and I agree with you. And it was a really they were in a big dilemma at the time. Um, yeah, with, in terms of the archiving, um, that has been a, ma a major issue, and, and now, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, both Mussolini and Sporiana are very pragmatic about trying to find a way, a system, in order to organize all the all the footage and have everything stored and obviously kept kept in safe places and or uploaded or um, so that is something that's definitely become a priority over the past um, you know, past couple of years um, and also to access you know so there's this, this films that uh, that that emerged like the, like the square where a lot of this footage had to be tapped into so having to go in and 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 run through all the footage and try and, and find these you know s specific images became a very big issue so I think now they've, they've tried to to make amends with that. Um, and in terms of the political question, uh, uh, I think s support Yemen is actually more, uh, well, at least tries to be a bit more objective and it's, they don't claim to be a political group or an activist group, but more, um, uh, more a human rights uh, sort of group where they try to document violations of human rights. Um, whereas with the, with Mussolini, they are more political and they're they're very open about their their, their views and they're very open about their uh, their positions with, with respect to, to, to different to different people. So their main their main position is anti-military. Um, so um, you know, I guess you know they do have they're in the position to say well we don't actually want to make we don't want to make video they, they did do I mean I edited personally edited a few um, a few protests from some some Kauai protests and some Lebanese protests um, so they did try to document a lot of these things but I guess they just never felt that they were in the it, 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 they could also not access, you know. I mean, you could not access Babat Adoli. You could not. You, you could have been killed. I mean, you know, they, 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 they were, there are also restricted limitations on, on the. On the, they did not let uh, uh, people in, you know, like journalists and so on. And also in some of the people would have been already attacked. So they, the divide is also. It's not just about uh, you know bad intentions, but it's also you know there were also these kind of limitations were also. Uh, yeah, access is always yeah. always a big, also a big issue, and 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 recent um, recent times as well. So the the, uh, the anti-protest law and you know people being you know picked up or you know arrested basically. So as time has gone on, it's been more and more difficult for them to, to document things and to and to, to do the work that they did previously when it was a lot more accessible and, and open. To them. Oops, I suppose one, maybe two more questions.
No, Amar, do you have a question? Okay. Well, that gives us um, well with three minutes to spare, I think. So the organizers are certainly happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, then that's enough time for me to thank. Um, the two panelists, that was really interesting. Thank you very, very much. I think that managed to cover a lot of ground in a very lucid way, so thank you.